Thank you very much. So uh, after lunch is uh, always a challenge. It works. Go ahead, Larry Taylor. Let's sure. Kick us hey, off folks. Here. So I'm Larry Taylor. Um, you're going to have to move for this one. Um, so if you're crocheting, you're going to have to put it down. Um, and you probably want to watch where your valuables are if you leave them behind, but you're going to be moving. Um, Bill and I have been working in schools, um, and we use a simple exercise, particularly when we're working on student leadership and reducing bullying and trying to improve school climate. And you'll see how all this connects in a minute. But what I'd like everyone to do is stand up, please, now. And I'd like everyone to find someone that they do not know and pair up with that person. So you must shift and you must find someone you do not know. Find an open space. Hey, guys. And we need, we need about six couples to move up onto the platform. Could, so, could Jim, would you take someone and go right up? up around this way, would you two please? go up on the platform? Oh, no, Megan, you you know you that person? You, you need to find someone way? else. Two of you up, right on the up. Yep. on the stage. Could you two, do you know each other? Could you go up on the stage, please? Two of you up on the stage? We need some folks up here. Hey guys, Someone in the you middle, do not know. go to the open spaces. Go yeah, to go the open, open spaces. spaces. Other folks can go to open spaces. It should be someone you do not know. Can I have hands up in the air if you're not paired you with someone? Sort of use up the back space. Hands up in the air if you're not paired with someone currently. We'll spread out a little bit, so you guys maybe move over here. We'll There's three over. here. That doesn't room. work. Are you not doing it? Ah, uh, here. There's a hand up in the air here. Find someone else with a hand up right in the here. air, please. Right Partner, Mark, right up here. All right, we're about ready. Here, oh. here are the simple directions, and you're not to talk from here you can, on you can in. Join these two ladies right here. Are we ready? We are ready. All right, so no talking, please, for the following stretch of time. What I'd like everyone to do is get about a foot to a foot and a half away from your partner at Jim the most, model facing right your partner, Just like that. facing your partner, and what you're going to do in an exceedingly respectful and positive way is you're going to check your partner out from foot to the top of your head, being very careful to observe everything you can about your partner because you're going to be asked some questions later. So memorize so now, your partner's physical appearance, hair, jewelry, rings, clothing, shoes. And memorize. some people are standing, particularly males are standing far apart. You need to stand a little closer if you're two feet apart. Nantucket, you need to get closer. Thank you. You two women are a little too far apart. Okay. So you're checking each other out. Does anyone need more time to check out your partner? Memorize their physical appearance, please. Now, if you've and no talking, I hear t I hear chatter. All right. So if you've done this before, we're going to really ask that when we do the debrief, you just sort of hang with us and let the people who have not done this before. Larry and I use this exercise, actually all over the country. Uh, we have we're kind of two trick ponies. We do two things. This is the second thing. <laughs> um, so this is a really important little exercise that we do with everybody from presidents of colleges to elementary school children. So if you like it, we could be asked back for the next time round. So okay. check out your partner. Everybody got it? Now, you're going to uh, shake hands, say goodbye. Don't, now, don't leave. Don't now, leave. No, 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 no. Now you no one said leave. Turn your back on your partner so you cannot see one another. So everyone should be facing back to back with their partner. And here's what you're going to do. You are going to quickly now change three things about your appearance that are noticeable. Three things that if someone had been watching you exceedingly carefully, they would notice the changes that took place. They can be very small things. They can be larger things. Uh, Three they things. They can be too large. Don't take your pants off. All right. Okay. Billy and I do that usually, and it's not a good thing. All right, we've got three things changing right now. All right, I see a lot of people doing a good job of changing. You're not to be peeking at your partner while you're doing this, and there really is no talking. There's, I see there's still people engaged in fairly intricate maneuvers at the moment. All right, you can imagine the next step. All right, here's what we're going to do. When I say go, you're going to turn around and face your partner again. And one of you will go first. I don't care who it is. 
Um, if there's a male and female, the female may go first. Maybe that's you know, respectful and nice. But you're going to turn back and you're going to see if you can identify the three things that were changed. And you can talk about this process as you do it. All right, everybody ready? Ready, go. You may turn back. See if you can locate the three things. Everyone ready? Everybody right. got it? We need silence again. All right. We need silence again. And we're going to ask some questions as part of this process. I'm going to wander around with the mic because we need to get a couple of responses. So again, let me say what I said at the beginning. When we do this work, we usually do it to try to work on training students to be leaders in their schools to make a difference, to make a difference about bullying, to make a difference about social climate. Does anybody? who has not done this exercise before, have a sense of why we might do this. What would be the purpose besides just a fun icebreaker to do? I see a hand. Excuse me. I'm coming to you. OK. I'd love to hear one or two reasons you got to move away from the speaker, because I've been cautioned not to come to the speaker with the microphone. Why do you think we might do it? Um, just to understand your surroundings. OK. Very good. And to be more perceptive of them, yes. perhaps? OK. Anyone else with an idea as to why we might do it? Sure. To really see the other person. OK, to really see the other person. Anyone else with an idea about why we would do this? There's one hand up there. Billy, you want to hand this yep. up? Sir. I was going to say that with uh, leadership, you get a lot of people that are very, they have tunnel vision on what their focus is, and they lose sight of what, what else is going on in their organization, what people are doing, and uh, what the problems are. Nice. Very good. So I have a very simple question. We're going to count. How many of you guessed zero, none of the three things that your partner changed? Raise your hand if you got zero out of three. Everybody got at least one. That's Very good. good. How many people got one out of the three only? Just right, nice and high. One out of the three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. How about two out of three? Two out of three. Let's look around. Most, Lot most of, them. of the hands. Very sure. nice. How about hands down? How many? All three things you guessed you saw. Woohoo! That is great. And. Um, this is the part that Larry and I sometimes do a little differently, but I'm going to just say freeze. The freeze means no talking, no more moving, no shifting of any clothing, rearranging. We'll just freeze right here. So we saw that most of you, how many of you really had no trouble finding something to change? You can raise your hand. You had no trouble figuring out three things to change. It was easy. You thought about it for a second, roll up a sleeve, move a ring around. The change itself was not difficult. And most of you had no trouble identifying the changes that you had. But since we stopped this exercise, Larry asked three questions. I asked how many. It's been about two minutes, which is actually longer than we sometimes take. In less than two minutes, here's my real question. How many of you have changed all three things now back to the way they were before in less than two minutes. Nice and high. Put those hands up. Hands up high. In less than two minutes, you've changed everything All right, back. So three quarters of the people here. All right, keep your hands up. How many have changed two out of the three back? OK. Put your hands down. Is there anybody that has not changed any of the things back to the way they were before? Mm, sequence over there on your right. All right, very nice. Excellent. I want to ask the same question that Larry just asked again. Given what we just saw about ourselves as a group, why would we do this exercise with college presidents, students, principals, teachers around the country? What's the point of this little change and made? And now the hint is, obviously, we are at a TEDx conference about second chances. Why would we do this exercise? Why is this activity number two? Two out of, you know, two out Let of two. Get, yes, sir. Wait. Sorry. Hey, nice to see you. <laughs> it's Tim, isn't it? Yeah. 
uh, first impressions and how we perceive ourselves. Okay. Great. That's part of it. Who else? Why would we do this little change exercise as one of the main activities when we go into schools around the country to talk about making schools work better for all kids, making them safer? Because change is hard, and sometimes when you stop looking, you go right back to the way you were doing it before. Okay, excellent. So change is hard, and sometimes we go right back to the way we are doing it before. Anything else? Others? Other thoughts? I want to challenge the change is hard. How many of you are part of systems where they're changing all the damn time? In some, in some ways, we call that leadership, right? <laughs> Let's just change stuff, and we'll call it leadership. But then you added this other part. What was the second part besides change is hard? Sometimes we go right back to the way before the change. How many of you experience that you, you belong to an organization and they announce some big change and they do trainings or they do a big announcement or something and people try it for a few minutes or a few weeks or a few days, but you look around a year later and everything's gone back to the way it was before. So when you're training a group of leaders, it isn't the change part that we talk about as being so difficult, it's the sustaining the change part. So when we work with a group of elementary school students to talk about how do you reduce bullying in your school, and they say, oh, let's bring Larry Taylor in and Brian Partridge and do a bullying workshop. Will that change people's minds about bullying maybe during the event? So the change might happen. People might be like, oh, I'm so sorry that this happens. I didn't realize it was so awful. That's bad, but then you go into the hallways an hour later and nothing's really changed. Everything goes back. So when we prepare students to focus on how do you sustain the change, how do you persevere and persist in the change, now we can create a plan to account for it. And when the kids do this, they really recognize the fact that they have to have a persistence to their efforts. It can't just be a one-shot deal. So I guess I want to take it all the way back. Let's say that we're talking about second chances and changing. We could all change every day, couldn't we? We could change any number of things about ourselves every day. But how many people make a change that lasts, a significant change that lasts, and what are the circumstances in one's life that tend to make that more or less likely? I guess I'd like one or two people in 30 seconds to give an example of a Something, you don't have to be very personal. Not so much on the change that you made, but why you think it happened and what might have been the circumstances that would make it happen. Anybody want to give that one a try? Hand way down there. I'm coming. Excuse me, I'm going to have to get by you. I think a person has to change their comfort zone before you can change anything else about yourself or your surrounding. That's difficult. <laughs> Anyone else want to give it a shot? Yep, come to me. Usually, from what I've seen, is it's either a result of illness or an accident. So some crisis. But some crisis, I think this is really important. Mm -hmm. So it takes some kind of big thing that really grabs your attention and holds your imagination or holds your attention as one of the ways and, and isn't that what's happened with school climate work, or maybe I'll use the word bullying work, isn't that what precipitated a, almost a decade of conversation about bullying was a crisis, was Columbine. We began this work two years before Columbine in Maine, interviewing middle school kids, and I'll never forget Larry Taylor interviewing these middle school kids, uh, talking about what's it like to be you in your school. And we were really clear, we were interviewing Kids who were victimized by bullying and harassment, they were targeted. Kids who were known perpetrators. And kids who identified in some way as leaders, so victims, perpetrators, and leaders. And we asked them to tell us about, what's it like in the school to be you? And a lot of those kids talked about how upset they were when they personally experienced bullying and how angry they were about it when adults didn't deal with it effectively. And that no matter what the adults said they were going to do, they would go back and it didn't change at all. Those kids had crises, personal crises. Do you think those kids who were victims, who were, I would call them experts, that they would be better leaders 
then the student council kids who get elected are popularly elected, no problem, to be leaders of a school. So lacking the personal crisis, lacking to the real empathy to know what it's like, you're probably not going to be the same kind of leader that you would be if you've lived and died that stuff every day. And we call this the dignity of expertise. The idea that you invite people to be part of the change who are experts on the issue. It's so important. And then the last thing I wanted to really point out here is when we were preparing for this and some other presentations we're going to be doing, I had a bunch of slides together for a PowerPoint. And a girl from this college, Lexi Rice, was helping me because I'm pathetic with technology, sorry, Eric. Um, and she was helping me come up with a really nice interactive PowerPoint presentation for this thing I'm doing next week in California. And I sat with her and reviewed it, and she started crying when she came to this dignity of expertise slide. And she said, I got to tell you, when I was putting this PowerPoint together and I saw what you and Larry were doing in these schools, I remembered this summer when I went home, my brother is a third, fourth grader at, in Portland at an elementary school. And he invited us to a ceremony where they said, we're inducting our new civil rights leadership team into the school, a civil rights leadership team to ensure racial har harassment does not exist in an elementary school. And he was picked to be one of the leaders. And she, Lexi said, my brother, he didn't think of himself as a leader. But he had friends who he watched being tormented and stuff in the school and bullied in the playground and stuff. And she said, I saw my brother change from the inside when they named him a leader. And they said, we need your help to make a difference in this school. She said, he beamed all summer about that. And she said, so the fact that you're taking this program about pick kids who are experts, teach them how change works so that they can make, so they don't do one event, they plan for what you just talked about, for sustaining that effort. And she saw the transformation of getting a chance to be that leader, to make a difference. So I thought that was kind of a nice full circle that Lexi, who was working with us on this stuff, saw her own brother experiencing the process. So I'll leave one question for you to think about, and then we're done. And that would be, uh, for those of you particularly into sports, uh, will the NFL be changed by the chance that has occurred with Miami Dolphins and the situation that has just happened? Or will it be just an example, and then it goes back to the same? What would need to happen to have that change sports and bullying? Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, guys.